Okay, I'm going to start recording now. I wanted to just briefly mention my 75th birthday on June 20th. Um, rather than just having a birthday party, which might take a very short time, we decided to combine that with a celebration of the advances made in this course and uh, Banff transplant pathology meetings and so on and make it a day long event with multiple different themes and different MCs and uh, so on. So uh, you don't have to come to this, but you can and you can decide which part if you are coming interest you and just show up for the interesting parts. So that's on Sunday, June 20th. Okay, so uh, Thomas, would you like to go first? Is that? Yeah, it? excellent. I'd be happy to. Okay. If you let me, if I can share my slides to you all. Hmm. Yep. Let me just uh, present that. Looks good. All right. Yeah, well, I'm so happy to be the first one presenting to you all. And, and thanks, everyone, for coming. I know you're not being tested on what I have to say. So I guess you're all here uh, really just to learn uh, about my topic, which is cheating death, anti-aging technologies, impacts and considerations. And one of the reasons I took this course is because we got to choose our topics. And I thought, you know, would, would, not, be, would it not be wonderful to um, live in youthful health for as long as you desire. Uh, and I want to look into that. So uh, let me just tell you about what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to begin by talking about the concept of a cure for aging. Uh, then I'll talk about what technologies might be used for curing aging. I'll talk about why we'd want to cure aging. And I'll tell you a bit about why people are concerned about curing aging, why we would not want to pursue it. So what is aging? Well, I think aging is the mother of all disease. It's the primary cause of blindness, deafness, immunodeficiency, cancer, frailty, diabetes, heart disease, neurodegeneration, disability, suffering, and death. It's the most malignant and serious of all bodily afflictions because it has no cure and a mortality rate of 100%. Um, so I have some technical uh, specifications about what aging means uh, up on the slide for you to see, but uh, what's clear is that aging in, uh, in many ways uh, is a disease. What would a cure for aging look like? Well, a cure for aging must enable individuals to live forever in a state of perpetual health and youth. It cannot mean making you live forever without making you healthy because that's a curse, not a cure. Uh, curing aging, therefore, means inventing a method for suspending or reversing the degradative physiological effects that occur in organisms over time. In short, curing aging involves extending one's health span indefinitely. So ideally, you'd stay uh, like this guy right here to the far left and um, never really go down here, <laughs> uh, inside and out. So uh, what might be able to achieve that effect? Well, I'd like to talk to you about some of the most promising uh, options, nanotechnology, neurotechnology, pharmacology, and regenerative medicine. So let's take a look at nanotechnology. So this is putting small devices on the scale of atoms or molecules uh, into your body to combat the hallmarks of aging, uh, often killing senescent cells or repairing bodily damage. So nanoparticles currently have clinical applications for medical imaging and in pharmacological and genetic therapies. But the problem is that nanobots and nanoparticles uh, of the sort needed to cure aging are considerably too complex to cure, uh, sorry, to engineer uh, and safely deploy at present. So uh, I think right now nanotechnology is not the most promising cure for aging, but it might well be uh, in the future. 
Another option is neurotechnology. So this is like the brain machine interfaces uh, that are popular to talk about today. Um, so this could enable you to upload your mind in sort of a whole brain emulation uh, via computer and persist as a digital artifact free from the biological constraints of aging. So digitizing the human brain uh, in this way is squarely in the realm of possibility, provided that um, our computational and scanning technologies continue to advance at a very fast rate. And it's conceivable that a future version of a technology like Elon Musk's Neuralink would enable humans to upload their mind uh, and live in the cloud. But this type of anti-aging technology is unique uh, compared to the others because it would al allow some very radical things to happen. Uh, for example, you could copy your mind and live in multiple instances in digital form. Um, another radical possibility is that you could download your computer-based consciousness back into organic human brains. So, you know, maybe you clone several of your bodies and when age decline uh, sets in, you will swap them out, kind of like parts in a car. Um, so it's definitely unique in that way because neurotechnology could enable sort of a quasi immortality. You know, you could have yourself backed up um, where the other technologies would only enable extension of your current life. Pharmacology. So this is the third option for solving aging. Uh, it's conceivable that you could have an array of drugs uh, to prevent or fix age-related physiological degeneration. Aubrey de Grey, a leading figure in the anti-aging world, authored a technical proposal for clearing up aging, and he thought it could be done by preventing cell atrophy, cleaning up, build up outside cells, cleaning up, build up inside cells, uh, and killing cancerous cells. And pharmaceutical companies are interested. Uh, they are developing drugs, uh, mostly drugs called senolytics, uh, that combat aging by killing senescent cells. Um, and research on that topic is increasing at an exponential rate. So that's good. Um, there's lots of organizations that are dedicated uh, solely to curing aging or, or reversing aging that are backed by billionaires and companies like Google. And these include Unity, Biotechnology, Calico Labs, uh, BioAge, uh, BioViva, the Longevity Fund, Ajax, uh, and the Methuselah Foundation. You can look these up and see about uh, what they're doing and how they think they can achieve this goal. But um, drugs may slow or stop uh, aging in the future, but more time is needed to find a complete solution because oftentimes they only target sort of one uh, body system. The last and I think the most promising and the most exciting uh, possible ways to cure aging is regenerative medicine and in particular cellular manip manipulation. So in the natural world, there are a few select animals uh, like that jellyfish I have there. Um, I'm just gonna call it uh, TD, it has a nice Latin name. And these animals are biologically immortal. Um, they can revert their cells to an earlier stage in their life cycle. They can reset their biological age uh, and never die from aging. And the hallmarks of aging I discussed earlier, or, or put them up on the slide for you to read, uh, largely result from sort of DNA wear and tear caused during regular life-sustaining operations. But the remarkable, the remarkable thing about DNA is that it never loses its youthful base code even as it ages. And this phenomena is what enables that jellyfish uh, to cheat death by resetting its age uh, and also what enables scientists to clone a youthful copy of an old animal using aged cells. So I know Barbara Streisand cloned her old dogs back into uh, youthful ones. Um, in 2020, David Sinclair, a researcher uh, at Harvard, demonstrated in nature that their lab had succeeded in reversing aging on a cellular level in mammals. So really big uh, find there. Um, Sinclair's lab found that aging's root cause is the accumulation of epigenetic noise that disrupts gene expression patterns. So genes forget their identity and fail to function properly. But uh, they came up with a solution um, using uh, cells that could reverse it. And uh, the solution is remarkable in several respects. You can do it as many times as you need. There doesn't seem to be uh, a limit. Uh, and also it seems to work in any human cell, uh, any human cell in the body. 
Um, so I hope that more research will be coming out soon because as I mentioned, this is in 2020, so quite new. So there's lots of reasons why you want to solve aging. And I'd like to talk to you about a few moral, economic, uh, and social. Uh, moral. Most directly, a cure for aging would be good because it'd bring about the greatest reduction in human death and suffering ever in history. Um, you know, it would eliminate death in many respects. Uh, aging symptoms caused large amounts of death and suffering. Uh, it was the primary cause that 35 million people died in 2005 from heart disease, stroke, cancer, and other chronic diseases. Uh, but I put 7.8 billion because, uh, at least in theory, uh, no one would have to die um, uh, of aging uh, if it were invented. So everyone alive today could uh, could carry on living. Uh, they were they had um, all the other things they needed to stay alive. But what's worse uh, about health uh, in the world today is that the socioeconomic distribution of age-related death and suffering is highly unequal. In terms of the 35 million dead I mentioned, 20% of these deaths occurred in high-income countries, while 80%, 80% occurred in low-income and middle-income countries. And like the reduction of death and suffering, the advancement of health equality is a worthy moral aim that a cure for aging would move toward. And when you think about it, uh, eliminating uh, aging would free up a lot of medical resources and expertise that could be de de redeployed uh, efficiently to fight death and suffering unrelated to aging. So infectious diseases, bodily trauma, rare disorders, genetic abnormalities, uh, et cetera. So even more people uh, would survive with best in class care. So let's move on to the economic reasons uh, why you'd want to cure aging. Uh, they're kind of in two groups, one that it saves money uh, and one that it produces uh, economic value. So medical services and pension support for old and aging people is very expensive. The United States federal government is projected to spend 50% of its federal budget, not including servicing the debt, and it does have a lot of that, uh, on those aged 65 and older in the next 10 years. So it's really a lot of money. And if you cured aging, uh, the considerable majority of, of healthcare expenses are, are occurring in, in the last several years of people's lives. Um, you know, those would no longer be necessary. Um, in terms of public pensions, the reason for, for offering uh, public pensions uh, is that it, there's an assumption that as you get older, um, you won't be able to serve in the labor force to produce goods and services because your physical and intellectual fitness uh, will decline. But uh, if you stayed in a state of youthful health forever, this justification may not exist. So you would have a far less old age support spending, maybe uh, none at all. Um, so in terms of how cure for aging would generate value, well, we can look at the historical record. Uh, small extensions in life expectancy that have occurred to date have large impacts in economic prosperity. Um, from 19... 70 to 2000, gains in life expectancy added about $3.2 trillion to the United States national wealth. So there's a lot of money per person that's being generated uh, in relatively small life extension uh, that's occurred in the past. Uh, the fact is welfare and living standards increase when people live longer and healthier and are more productive and more innovative. And that's the next thing I want to talk about, um, innovation generation. If aging was cured, I think it would unleash extraordinary innovation. Uh, for one thing, good innovators wouldn't die. You know, you'd have more of them sticking around doing good work. Another thing uh, is that a cure for aging would drive people toward higher education, specialization, and risk-taking because they have more time to do it. Um, innovation, according to research, peaks in about your 40s, but this is for many too late. Um, so live forever, maybe you'd be able to do uh, more interesting things. Um, so let's move on to the social reasons why you'd want to cure aging. One possibility is that it'd bring us all greater peace and calm. And this is because um, I think all of us recognize that we have limited time to be alive uh, and even more limited time to be alive in a state of youthful health. Uh, so it, it, you know, 
we get stress about that, existential stress. But if aging can be stopped, there'd be fewer reasons to feel rushed, There'd be more time to explore other careers, other possibilities. There'd be more time to live other lives. Uh, there'd be a great sense of relief in knowing that you are immune from life passing you by. Another social benefit in terms of the future of humanity uh, is that a cure for aging could help ensure our species survival and galactic proliferation. Uh, a great obstacle to long duration space travel is that astronauts would just die of aging. Uh, before they reach their destination because it takes a very long time to get there. But if a cure for aging existed, lifetime or generational space flights aimed at setting up space colonies uh, and maybe um, better uh, planets better for our uh, proliferation, you know, not Mars, something maybe that has a bit of greener on it uh, would be possible. Another potential good social reason for curing aging is that if people live to see the full impact of environmental degradation uh, resulting from their consumption patterns, uh, they might change their ways. They might become more invested in, uh, in, in green initiatives uh, and Earth's health because they'd be uh, concerned about the results of their behavior impacting them directly. Uh, a final potential impact cure for aging would have would be a decline in religious fanaticism. Perhaps I think the main reason for the existence of organized religion is that it makes death less daunting. And if involuntary death were the exception for people, not the rule, the exception, I think people would be less invested in religious fanaticism uh, and tradition which subordinates their uh, individuality. They might not uh, feel the need to cling to a legacy religion for existential support. They might uh, want to go and explore their spirituality uh, in other ways. So let's get into why people don't want to cure aging, uh, what concerns they might have. And I want to talk um, about a few involving overpopulation, resource depletion, health inequality, and progress inhibition or progress stagnation. So uh, people are concerned if people don't die, there'll be overpopulation. And this is just wrong. Uh, overpopulation is a myth. Individuals have fewer children when they're rich and educated. Population growth is already starting to slow. And I put a projection on the slide there for you all to uh, see. In future, growth in populations will continue to slow and decline around the world, even in fast growing continents like Africa and Asia. Uh, the fact is the world population is set to peak in 2064 at 9.7 billion and decline thereafter. Based on these trends of growth, it's clear that overpopulation is not a concern, uh, whether it be, uh, whether a cure for aging be invented or not. Um, and keep in mind, even in a world where a cure for aging would be invented, people would still die from all sorts of um, involuntary causes. Uh, and maybe after living for a thousand years, people would be so happy uh, and feel their lives were complete and, and there'd be nothing else for them uh, to do and they, they'd seek out an honorable suicide. But just as likely uh, in highly functioning societies, it's very possible there would always be new and exciting things happening and that uh, people would, would never uh, feel as if they've exhausted uh, all life has to offer, even living after uh, a thousand years or more. Another concern is that we're, the Earth's resources would be depleted uh, if you have all these people um, living in, the, in very grand fashion. Uh, people will say, you know, look uh, at the United States. If everyone in the world lived as the average American, there'd be a crisis in resource insufficiency. And it's true. Uh, but I think this objection fails in that population growth is slow. Uh, and population growth will happen irrespective of whether or not a cure for aging is invented. And market and consumption patterns will change based on supply and demand. And I think for every problem, there's a potential technology which offers a solution that can produce a good more efficiently or find a sufficient complement. Our modern world, anti-aging or not, is a world not of shortage, uh, but of overabundance. Our problems are in the distribution of goods and not their production. Let's move on to the objection of health inequality. And I put an image there from uh, <laughs> a, a movie. 
uh, where you had a bunch of uh, uh, rich people uh, living uh, detached from Earth, which was, uh, as you can as you can see, a, a state of decay. It's called Elysium. Uh, I don't know if you've all seen it, but it, I enjoyed it. Um, so this objection is that the critics fear a dystopia uh, where the rich people and powerful people have an exclusive monopoly uh, on anti-aging technology, um, and they they sort of deprive everyone else of it. Um, I don't think this objection is compelling. It, yes, it's true that a cure for aging, if it's invented uh, in, in wealthy countries, like it most likely will be, um, will be enjoyed only and predominantly by uh, rich people in rich countries for several, several years uh, after it's invented, just like all the other modern technologies we've seen, gene sequencing, cellular phones, they all start out uh, with rich people in rich countries. But uh, the fact is these technologies become less expensive and more available over time. You know, today everyone has a cell phone. Um, so yes, maybe it'd be invented by elites, but uh, it would be more available over time. And there'd be no incentive for people to deprive other people of a cure for aging. You know, it would be enormously profitable uh, to sell um, so once it's invented, I think it'll become less expensive, more accessible, and also better quality as time goes on. The last and most pers persuasive objection, I think, of, of the ones I presented to you um, is that a cure for aging would stagnate human social progress. And this is because large changes in ideas that are embedded in the structure of our society and societies in the past did not change because people carefully revised their view based on considering all um, you know, relevant facts and opinions, but um, they occurred because people died. Uh, you know, th their views died with them. You know, racial supremacists, religious zealots, radical nationalists, these people used to be more common in the past, now they're uh, not. And we can imagine that if the Victorians or the Roman Empire had found a cure for aging in some plant or some procedure, it would be the case that their ideas endured, uh, that they did not change significantly, and that the most unjust and unreasonable parts of their society stayed the same. And today we don't live in a utopia. A uh, cure for aging, I think, has the potential to entrench our modern social divisions and injustices. But, you know, that, that is, that's one view. I think that it's also very possible that stagnation is not inevitable, uh, that as people become older, maybe, you know, everyone seems to have this anti-aging treatment. It's a very fashionable thing in society to change your views and people become uh, more worldly and more connected to one another uh, and more interested um, in, in the bigger picture uh, of ideas and, and in um, good virtuous practices. So uh, that's the end of my presentation, but uh, my, key takeaway my key takeaway points for you all uh, is that aging is a disease, solving aging is possible, solving aging is good, and solving aging is safe, or uh, in other words, the critics are wrong. And uh, for a moment, I'll just put my contact information there so you guys uh, can message me if you want. But now I'd love to hear your thoughts about what I've uh, presented. Um, you know, do you agree? Don't you agree? Uh, do you want to live in, in health until you, you know, for, long, for as long as you, as you want, or um, maybe a <laughs> hundred years even is too much for you? So I'm turning it over to you all. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Thomas. Um, I wanted to point out how Canadian changing your mind is. You, you may not have, have realized that, but for instance, foreign trained physicians may enter Canada saying, yeah, I practice medicine in the country I'm coming to, but I have no intention of practicing medicine in Canada. And the next day they can change their mind and say, oops, I changed my mind. So <laughs> there are many things like this sort of woven into our society. So our feelings that people who feel very strongly about something will never change their minds, 
therefore the only way to get change is for those people to die. I think particularly in you know Canada, that's not supportable because we are allowed to change our, our minds quite a lot in Canadian society. I actually have a sort of follow-up question about that idea of stagnation. So I was wondering if these anti-aging technologies sort of freeze our body and our brain in a certain point in time, whether it would also freeze our brain's development in that point of time, right? So for example, you know, in our formative years of, you know, going through high school and university, um, you know, we're building that white matter, we're making those connections between neurons, depending on what activities we engage in and what we learn. And so my question is, is it possible that if we sort of freeze our brain in that point of development, that we're constantly, you know, building those new connections throughout our life, so there is no danger of stagnation? Yeah, like, uh, just to go back to the um, types of, oh, darn, I don't know if I can do this. Yes, here we are. Mo most of these technologies, I think, are just aimed at stopping or reversing the age degradation. Uh, they're not really freezing it. I, I think certainly there'd be some drugs that would might, that might just freeze uh, aging, and then that way you could um, have I don't know, like less neurological development, but most of them are just reversing it. Uh, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be freezing it. Um, I just had a question about the drug aspect too. Um, so if humans now rely on the pharmacological aspect in regards to aging, then wouldn't that also have some side effects which are not known right now that could be associated to that because the whole phenomenon is a new thing. And then wouldn't that then cause other rises to other stuff that we're not aware of? Yeah, who knows, very potentially. Uh, I think that it'd be hard to find a drug that doesn't have some sort of side effect that, you know, is just you know, without any, uh, you know, does its job, nothing else. Uh, th those are rare, I think. Um, I was also wondering about the resource depletion point, how you're seeing that um, it probably won't happen because we can find solutions for things. I'm just wondering, like right now in our world, um, there's huge issues with resource depletion already. I think just more so like in how it's distributed across the whole world because there are people that are living in an extreme poverty. Um, and so when talking about a whole new generation, I guess, of people that won't age or if aging is slowed, how do you think that resource allocation or depletion will factor in um, if right now in our current world, um, things are not evenly distributed? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, back to what I said, obviously this technology to begin with is likely to be expensive and only available to relatively wealthy people. You know, it's not like um, some, some small time farmer in a developing country would be likely to afford it. Uh, but uh, as time goes on, it'll become um, more available, I think. So even for relatively poor people, uh, it will be accessible, um, hopefully. And I think if you look at, trends in, in economic history, people are getting richer and richer. You know, they have access to more material wealth. Uh, their lifespans are, are increasing over time. Um, so I, I think, it, yes, this is definitely a problem to begin with, but hopefully uh, trends will continue and everyone uh, will be better off uh, as other inventions occur and everyone will be able to uh, access this technology eventually, uh, presuming it's invented. Um, I, I have a question about it. Um, do you feel that, let's say there are two camps of um, individuals who one accepts the, the prospect of not having to die and the other group 
would rather have a natural course in life and accept death as it comes, would that create any division or conflict amongst people who are in those different camps? You know, it's hard to say. Uh, if I was speculating, I don't know if it would create conflict. Um, I think I think people might look at, upon that as just a, a perfectly acceptable uh, way to live. And as I mentioned, it's um, possible that people after living for a very long time, after a thousand years, might choose to discontinue the anti-aging treatments um, and then live naturally uh, and, and die uh, or naturally. Um, or uh, just seek out some some honorable suicide, uh, but maybe they'll continue to to live forever because they just they love life and everything it has to offer, and then you know they recognize that there are potentially infinite more beautiful experiences for them to enjoy. But you know I, I don't know if it would cause a division. If I if I had to speculate, I'd say no. But um, I'd like to hear if you think it would. Um, <laughs> I I guess I guess it would come to the nature of. Uh, how society would treat it and I guess the nature of what this anti-aging or immortality cure would be um, I, I guess in my in my view um, people wouldn't be as comfortable with the ability of not being able to die like as you say you can let's say stop the anti-aging treatments and you would be able to succumb to a natural death but if once you opt into this program you aren't able to pull out or there's always going to be some copy of you floating around there that could present a lot of i mean ethical or philosophical issues um going into it and i mean humans have had a pretty big problem of finding just lines to divide uh, divide each other essentially so having a really good social framework to support this and I mean, whether it's euthanasia or whatever methods to allow still the freedom of choice to go as how you please would be a good alternative or a solution to make sure there's not as much division in this reality. Okay, well, thank you. If you'll unshare, then- Certainly, thanks everyone. I thought that was great. Good presentation. Okay, so next uh, is on Bui. So on, you can take us through your presentation. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Uh, a, a lot of Thomas um, points have uh, are in my presentation, so I hope you will still <laughs> enjoy my presentation. Okay, everyone. Um, today I will be talking about a potential technology in the future called mind uploading and some ethical considerations that come with it. Um, but first, I just want to give you a brief reminder of technological singularity and transhumanism. According to Moore's law, computing power doubles approximately every two years. At one point, this technological um, sing, uh, growth will be incomprehensible and irreversible, resulting in a drastic change in the human civilization. As you can see on the graph at the top right, where you can see at the point of the singularity, we will have transhumans. So according to transhumanists, the human species in their current form are not, the, are not at the end of their development but rather at the beginning. In the future with singularity, we will be able to transcend biology by eliminating aging and improving human intellectual, physical and psychological capacity with our most groundbreaking human enhancement medicine. Disease, pain and suffering will be things of the past. However, such a great technology will bring along many ethical issues that we haven't seen before. Here is the brief overview of what I will be talking about today. We will go through these one by one. First, I will answer the question of what is mind uploading? I will propose some benefits of mind uploading, some existential risk and social perils of mind uploading, and I will suggest some moral justification of mind uploading and some few uh, ethical consideration. After that, we will talk about how we could best prepare ourselves for the arrival of mind uploading by rethinking our human technology relationships. So 
For the ethics section, which is the main part of my presentation, I will address these following questions. How, why should this technology be developed and allowed? How will the risk associated with it be mitigated? How can mine uploading be made safe for everyone? Who should get access to mine uploading? And how should people with uploaded mines be ethically treated? But first, let's talk about mine, what mine uploading is. Mine uploading is not a new topic. It has been the subject of many science fiction movies, films, books, and TV series. In those works, mine uploading is always described as some evil technology that will eventually betray humans. For example, in Robin Hansen, The Age of M novel, he talked about a future in which researchers have learned to copy the human mind to a computer. They then run this program to create M's or emulated people. M's eventually outnumber humans and dominate the earth. Even though this scenario is fascinating, I do not agree with their definition and interpretation of mind uploading. If such a groundbreaking technology allows human to recreate minds in a digital form, it seems irrational to make copies of human that will thrive while the original copy dies. After all, no one could guarantee if such a copy would behave the same way the original person does or would uphold the same moral beliefs. On the other hand, this act of cloning and creating multiple instances of self, in my opinion, diminishes the value of individuality, um, self-identity, and uniqueness of mind by reducing AI to a copy of an existing human with no original thoughts and little agency, we establish the exact opposite of what our technology is heading and aiming to achieve. So I will propose my definition of mind uploading. It is relocating the mind, a collection of memories, personality, and characteristic of one individual from their original organic brain to an artificial computational substrate, leaving absolutely nothing behind. This removes the need for an independence on the vulnerable biological bodies. Mind uploading will give birth to a new generations of human 2.0, whose bodies are entirely made of machines and artificial materials. Incoming information will be processed and analyzed within the new brain, which contain every component of the latest computer model, including a processor and a hard drive. Through private network connections, these brains will be directly linked to the internet and their corresponding personal cloud storage, where thoughts, emotions, memories are stored, encrypted, and safeguarded by the most up-to-date cybersecurity service. New thoughts and feelings after being generated offline could be uploaded to the cloud storage and memories could be downloaded to the brain. This large scale society of uploads and downloads will revolutionize human civilization. Communication will be done mostly through the internet where people will share their thoughts and emotions even before they speak. Humans 2.0 will no longer survive on food and water, but rather on electric city generated from renewable sources such as solar and wind energy. The definitions of reproduction and death, therefore, will also need to change. We know that researchers and physicians have been able to 3D print organs to be used in transplant. Researchers have also taken steps to create robots that self-replicate using 3D printing, suggesting that this might be the new form of reproduction for those who engage in mind uploading. As mind uploading will transform the nature of the human race, we also ought to redefine the concept of death. It will be regarded solely as brain death in which the new brain fails to generate new information, 
or loses its processing capacity. Brain death also happens when the old brain, that is the biological brain, is severely damaged prior to mind uploading. Individuals could also voluntarily choose to terminate their digital brain activity. For mind uploading to be possible, we have to accept three technical assumptions, physicalism, scannability, and computability. Physicalism holds that everything about the mind is contained within the physical brain and follows law of nature. Connections between neurons in a brain are called connectomes, and many scientists believe that these connectomes hold the information of what makes us who we are. The second assumption of scannability entails that one day, humans will be able to scan these connectomes, map their activity, and reconstruct the brain's neural network to digitize the human mind. Lastly, mind uploading assumes that the mind is a computational system and its core mental processes, like reasoning, decision-making, and problem-solving, work in a similar fashion to a Turing machine. The question of whether mind uploading could be done remains controversial. Randall Kern, a neuroscientist who worked as a research professor at Boston University Center for Memory and Brain, he said that all of the evidence seems to say that in theory, mind uploading is possible. It is extremely difficult, but it's possible. So then you could say that it is visionary, but not mad, because that implies that you're thinking of something that's just impossible, and that's not the case. To correctly recreate the mind, we have to map out billions of individual molecules that produce behaviors at cellular level. Mapping a single molecule alone to the highest level of detail produces 3.14 times 10 to the 14 terabytes of data. Scanning a single mind that is made of 86 billion neurons will generate more data than the capacity of all data storage on Earth. Some scientists also argue that there is no way the human consciousness can be reduced to a software program running on a robot, however smart or sophisticated. However, the current technology doesn't have enough data to tell us for sure if it is possible or not. Moving on to the benefits of mind uploading, I think we can all agree that mind uploading will grant us a utopia of immortality. Some enthusiasts believe that mind uploading would be better than cryonics in preserving the culture of human species. By separating bodily functions from the biological body, we completely abolish cellular aging, cognitive decline, and chronic diseases such as cancer. Physical accidents that, for example, might paralyze biological bodies will not harm the body as humans 2.0. Mind uploading will also significantly improve the quality of life. The ability to offload memories and existing knowledge to the cloud storage will lead to a significant increase in the cognitive processing speed. This will result in a generation of highly proficient and intelligent workers. Many mental health problems such as anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorders might be solved by the ability to lock away certain thoughts, emotions, and memories. Also, since healthcare resources will no longer be focused on treating diseases, they will be used to create better human enhancement technology. A similar functionality has already uh, been under development at Neuralink Corporation a brain-computer interface and neuroprosthetics company started by Elon Musk in 2016. Neuralink is developing ultra-high bandwidth brain-machine interfaces to connect humans and computer. These devices restore motor and sensory function in neurological diseases and brain damages, such as stroke and spinal cord injury. In the future, the company aims to develop other technologies for human enhancement. 
mine uploading will be the solution to our population and environmental problem. The new mechanical body will allow humans to travel to the most dangerous places on Earth without the risk of radiation, oxygen shortage, high pressure, etc. Uh, mine uploading will facilitate interstellar travel, providing a way for humanity to escape a potential global catastrophe and to relieve the burden on Earth's natural resources. This technology is being developed by NASA, NASA and DARPA. Their 100-year Starship Initiative proposes to send people to the star by the year 2100. Currently, to reach the nearest star, you will have to travel at 35.7 million um, miles per hour. This extremely high speed endangers the survival and safety of astronauts on board. The solution to this problem is to abandon the biological bodies and to create e-crews. The emulation of astronauts' mind in solid state electronic circuitry. E-crews will not require air, water, food, medical care, or radiation shielding, and they will be able to withstand extreme acceleration. So there are some existential risk and social perils to mine uploading. First, what would be the purposes of human then if we have an internal life? And if we have um, an internal life, what would be the meaning of it? How can a being made entirely of metal without a heart and a brain be referred to as human? And if mine uploading is possible and we move towards human engineering, such as 3D printing as mean of reproducing, then how can we ensure that these humans 2.0 are truly humans? To answer to these questions, I will turn to the pulse phenomenology philosophy. Pulse phenomenology is a philosophy of technology that emphasizes the role of technology in transforming the human experiences. Both phenomenology proposes four ways technologies play a role in human world relation, ranging from being embodied and being read to being interacted with and being in the background. In embodiment relations, technology form a unity with human, which is so essential that the world becomes strange without them. Examples of this relation include eyeglasses or pacemaker. Hermeneutic relations are relation in which technology changes our interpretation of the world, such as a thermometer or MRI. In authority relation, human beings interact with technologies, with the world at the background, such as ATM and iPhones, the last relation is background in which technologies are the mere context for human experiences and actions. Moving forward, I believe mind uploading will likely have the embodiment and hermeneutic relations with human. This means that mind uploading will not be external to our being, but rather what makes us human. It will be integral to our perception of the world and our interaction with it. Furthermore, the definition of life and human nature are not static. In creating and reforming technology, we are also redefining the kinds of humans we are and will become. As evidenced by the long history of organ transplantation, we constantly redefine what it is to be human, what is the values of life. And making life internal is not going to make us less human. When all personal information will be available online, individuality, self-identity, and privacy will be at risk. Individuality is an important part of maintaining one's identity. With others' information readily available online, a person may be less inclined to create and develop their sense of individuality, since it can be easier to just steal from someone else. 
a strong and prosperous society needs and cherishes um, individuality. Diverse and creative points of view push for innovation and new invention. Therefore, people who lack a firm sense of individuality will soon become a burden to society. On the other hand, knowledge, feelings, and thoughts of a person can be stolen from their brain in their personal cloud storage. These leave the person vulnerable to brain harvester who can steal their identity and use their information for vile purposes. This means that mind uploading has the potential to democratize the next generation of evil. This powerful technology, when in hands of extreme individual, could inflict unimaginable damages on others. So to solve that problem, um, cybersecurity and legal systems surrounding identity theft and organ trafficking need a significant revision or a complete reform. It is important that we improve cybersecurity to foster self-identity and intellectual properties. We also need to enforce harsh penalties for the abuse of mine uploading. Another risk of mine uploading will come from transferring a criminal's mind. As I will discuss next, everyone should have an equal right to mine uploading. However, if the criminal faces a death sentence, their digital mind will be terminated. Nevertheless, their existing information in the cloud storage should be preserved for analysis. This allows investigators to gain unique insights into the criminal psyche to generate patterns for crime and to create a crime-free society. There are three major moral questions that need to be addressed uh, when moving forward with mind uploading. First is how is mind uploading ethically justified? Second is who should have access to mind uploading? And third is how should humans 2.0 be ethically treated? Um, I will attempt to uh, answer those questions with two possible application of ethic, top down and bottom up. We can look at mind uploading from a consequentialist perspective. A consequentialist perspective um, views the outcome of a given action as the ultimate moral determinant about its rightness and wrongness. An example of this is utilitarianism. Utilitarianism favors actions that maximize the utility, which is often defined in terms of happiness and well being. This also means that they prefer minimizing misery. Mind uploading, therefore, is highly favorable and should be implemented as it eliminates all sufferings that come from diseases, illnesses, and aging. At the same time, it maximizes the collective benefits of creating a very efficient society. Another top-down approach to mind uploading is the ontological perspective. It is obligation, duty, and rule-based ethic, which could be used to assess mind uploading as right or wrong based on how it conforms to normative standards. Below are some ethical principles that favor the implementation of mind uploading and justify how it should be made accessible to everyone. So the first principle I want to talk about is capability and well-being theories of justice. Capability theory states that the qualities of a person's life depends on what they are capable of, um, such as life and bodily health. A just society should then provide the person with these capabilities. The well-being theory also recognizes that a just society is built on ensuring individuals can experience well-being. With mind uploading, we'll, we will be able to assure that everyone has a decent and fulfilling life. To decide who should get access to mind uploading, I will turn to egalitarianism and libertarianism. 
uh, from an egalitarianism perspective, it is important that a technology being so important to humans should be distributed equally to everyone if they desire to, regardless of their financial condition, socioeconomic status, race and ethnicity. If mind uploading becomes the new norm of medicine, then it is crucial to provide every society member with the choice to engage in mind uploading. A libertarian values, personal freedom, autonomy, liberty, and free association, which all point towards making mind uploading available to everyone who chooses to pursue it. Services like mind uploading should be treated like any other routine medical procedures, such as plastic surgeries. The questions of how we should treat humans 2.0 morally lies at the core of the debate about their moral standings. Other than a new body, humans 2.0 have every moral property of a traditional human, including sentience, cognitive properties, moral agency, and relationship, which all give them a moral status. Because of their moral status, humans 2.0 deserve to be treated with the same moral rights as with traditional human. So to answer this question better, I will turn to a bottom-up approach. In June 2014, the Supreme Court of the United States finalized its decision in Riley v. California case, in which the justices ruled that police officer may not search a cell phone's content without a warrant after an arrest. Chief Justice John Roberts declared that modern cell phones are now such a pervasive and insistent part of daily life that a proverbial visitors from Mars might conclude that they were an important feature of human anatomy. This is the first time the Supreme Court explicitly considered cyborgs in, or augmented humans in the case law even if it was a kind of metaphor, this case marks the beginning of understanding and developing laws for augmented humans. The person you see on the left is Neil Harbison. He is a cyborg artist and an activist for trans species right. He is the first person in the world with an antenna implanted in his skull and for being legally recognized as a cyborg by government. His antenna sends audible vibrations through his skull to report information to him. His Wi-Fi antenna also allows him to receive signals and data from satellites. As an activist, he proposes some legal rights for the future cyborgs that I adopted for this presentation. The first right is freedom from disassembly. Humans 2.0 should have their bodily integrity protected and they should be free from unnecessary search, seizure, suspension, or interruption of function and dismantling without a fair cause. This includes their uploaded mind and other intellectual properties. The second right for humans 2.0 is freedom of morphology. This means that they shall be free to engage in any permanent adaptation, alteration, modification, or augmentations of their body. They shall be free from coerced or other involuntary, involuntary morphological changes. The third part, which I think is the most important part is equality. Humans 2.0 should have absolutely the same equal rights as traditional human. They shall receive all rights, benefits, and responsibilities extended to natural persons. Um, this includes, but are not limited to rights to liberty, political participation, rights to um, social, economic, and cultural equality. The last one, is right to bodily sovereignty. 
Humans 2.0 are entitled to a complete dominion over their bodies and intelligence. So these cases give us some answer of how humans 2.0 should be ethically treated in the future. Mind uploading will create a psychological benchmark for determining, for determining what is a human. Reformation to the legal and ethics system to provide safety for traditional humans and humans 2.0 are necessary but insufficient to prepare for the arrival of mind uploading. How we perceive interactions between human and non-human intelligence will also need to change. This is because our knowledge of right or wrong, or what we call our moral consciousness, is structured by an intersubjective intentionality. That means in order to make conscious acts, you must consider, acknowledge, and respond to other beings in our world. The notion that technologies serve us and stay in the background and humans are superior to other non-human beings is outdated and problematic. Holding on to this notion will prevent us from making ethical decisions in the future with, the, with regard to mind uploading. So, I suggest that in the future, we should adopt the concept of the actor network theory to rethink the human technology relationships. In this theory, humans and technologies are bound up together in networks of socio-technical collectives and they work together. Technology is an actor that is capable of agency, their role of being a bystander, a slave in a sense, is strongly disregarded. So to prepare for the future, I want to once again uh, say that the idea of enhancing our bodies is not new, but the extent to which transhumanists take the concept is. We have such a long history of human augmentation from making wooden leg and hearing aids and teeth dentures. In the future, as possible as we can connect ourselves to memory chips or an antenna, we will be able to use mind uploading to transfer every human biological components to computer machines. By merging men and machine, science will produce humans with vastly increased intelligence, strength, and lifespan as jobs that require physical actions will be replaced by AI in the future, our con contributions to the world will mainly be done through the mind. So with the singularity approaching soon, mind uploading will be inevitable as it is the only way humans can retain their role in this world. The terror over robot domination and AI control is rooted in our history of conquest and exploitation than in the actual threat of AIs. While AI can still pose an existential danger to human, if they are well-developed, they will benefit humanity immensely. Conversation around mind uploading should help us reflect on what it is to be human and what it could be rather than reinforcing any conservative ideas of the human nature. To harness the power of mind uploading, we need to construct new norms, ethical standards, and legal system. Mind uploading will bring the legal challenges of forecasting, preventing, and mitigating malicious use of technology. That means better cybersecurity needs to be in place. What seems undeniable to me though, is that humans 2.0 must hold the same rights as traditional humans. Therefore, I call for a radical dehumanization, which is the unlearning of human prejudices and ways of living. The fear that technologies will be dehumanizing are legitimate, but misplaced. What is important that we, is that we must move away 
from worrying that humanity will be replaced and ruled by an artificial superintelligence so that we can prosper with mind unloading in the future. Um, thank you for listening. That is the end of my presentation. Um, I will just take questions. Yeah, I think if you unshare, it makes it easier. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Any questions? I have a question, and I'm not sure if it's just because I'm not quite understanding. I mean, none of us really understand how a brain scan will actually look like and what implications it will have until the technology is made. Um, but I was wondering about how procreation um, procreation would look like, right? Like, would <laughs> would we be able to have children <laughs> in the <laughs> digital universe, you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, so so in in the ethics part, I mentioned um, that I will use libertarianism to, um, I guess, regulate mind unloading. That is, anyone who wants to do it can do it. Um, but when they do it, they should know that by transferring everything to a machine and abandoning their biological bodies, they will not be able to um, perform like conventional reproduction methods. So um, uh, when, when I think of mind uploading, I think that in the future, not everyone will be machines. There will be people who choose to stay in their biological bodies and that is totally fine. They can still um, reproducing in, um, in, in, in a regular manner. Um, but people who choose to uh, engage in mind uploading should start thinking about like 3D printing uh, as a mean to um, reproduce. Mm -hmm. um, along the same lines, do you see any ethical implications for age, right? Should there be a certain age after which people are allowed to upload their brain scans? Um, at first I thought, um, I thought people who are over 65 should be able to um, should should be the only people who get mind uploading, um, but but then I I can't disregard that thinking because that would be discriminating like young people and and because um, aging technically um, starts when you are like eighteen or sixteen or nineteen, um, so I think that allowing people who are over eighteen to make their own decision would be the best because then we wouldn't violate as many um, ethical ethics. The, Thank you. The question of whether you would enjoy the process or enjoy being an upload is complicated by the prediction that you would be able to choose your mood and it would include all sorts of moods and feelings that you're not currently able to have because you're sort of li limited in what you can influence and what you can feel. So there is also likely to be a lot of pressure in society for people to obtain evidence that people who do mind uploading are happy, right? <laughs> and, and it works out, right? But how would you know? Because the, 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 the pressure for the first, first mind upload to report back that it's just great, you know, that they're enjoying every moment would be tremendous. And if they could dial that dial of feelings to whatever they wanted, how would you be able to trust the answer? So, and isn't that then a big question for you? How do you determine the success of this? How do you determine? I mean, it one is how widely adopted it is, but you could imagine a horrifying scenario where actually it's 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 completely terrible to be a mind upload, but everybody does it anyway, right? So the you know embrace of it, the, the number of people doing it, 
is very high, but the outcome's terrible. But no, nobody is able to truthfully tell you that they don't don't enjoy it. So how how would you determine whether it's successful or not? Um, I think that is a very um, difficult question because even even now, even when we are in our biological bodies, when we take these like psycholo uh, psych psychology tests, there there is still bias and the result vary depending on our mood on that day or uh, what we see on the roads when we came to the test center. Um, yes, so when I think of mind uploading and testing the outcomes of it, I would imagine uh, when we take the participant in the room, we would somehow have to ask them to turn off their mood changer if that was um, um, functionality in, um, in them uploaded mine so they they should turn off any like mood changer or any controller so that we can set like a baseline on how they should feel and then we we conduct a test like a very regular um psychology test uh at least i i would imagine it would become like that easy um but it's the future so um the best we could do is just to predict and hope for the best so what would personal appearance be? Would it be like what the, the ceramic slab that you ended up being on looks like? Might just be shiny and, and black, right? Or um, would it be the, the, the sort of representation of you? Maybe you, you would have like a profile icon or something, right? So what, what, what would be the essence of personal appearance? Um, so so for, for me, I think that um, in the future, humans can have like the physical appearance and also they will have an appearance um, in their like network, in their, uh, the network where their uploaded minds are. Um, for the physical uh, appearance, we already know that um, scientists have already been able to create like dolls and robots that look very similar uh, similar to human. They have like silicon skin and it looks very um, texture, um, very like skin-like. Um, so I, I think that in the future, we will, we will have that as our physical appearance. That That is, we have like silicon skin and um, our organs and um, the internal of our body is just um, machines and computers. And for the um, digital network, um, I think uh, I, it's hard to imagine how that digital network will look like. Um, but yes, I think like we can just represent ourselves as like um, an, an icon or like a, an image of what our physical body looks like. Um, I guess in a, uh, just a quick extension to that point, um, what do you think the extent or the nature of the conscious lived experience would be for an uploaded mind? Since, you know, the human conscious or the human experience involves a lot of the sensory information that you receive on a day to day and the way that you interact with that. Um, in, in When your mind is uploaded, what kind of lived experience would be had would it be hyper simulated to be like in real life or just like as a human being, but just in a simulated environment or would it look very different from what it would normally look like? Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure what you mean by like consciousness. Do you mean like perception and like sensation? Like when, when you touch my hand, like I, I feel that kind of touch being interpreted to in, in my brain? Or just like the, the scope of what living would be like for a mind uploaded individual in which like would you have a perception of body like would the would the understanding of body in this simulated world be important or uh, yeah yeah i i think definitely definitely we will have a sense of where our body is in space because Technically, we are transferring everything, absolutely everything in our brain to um, a digital network. And a part of um, our brain, 
um, I, I think it's called the somato sensory um, cortex. Um, it helps us identify the location of where we are in space. So I imagine that that part of the cortex, that function of that cortex will also be transferred somehow digitized um, into like number zero and one uh, and to be imported to the network. And also about sensation, I think um, I made my point that one, one of the uh, function of mind uploading would be to help people who have like physical injuries to regain their motor and sensory functions. That is, um, that is to assume that mind uploading will help us um, maintain um, our sensory if that is not damaged and to help people who has damaged sensory and motor function to regain those. I, I don't know if that <laughs> answers your question. Yeah, it was, it was pretty open-ended, so that's, that, that's good. <laughs> you know, I think when we talk about mind uploading, we might want to even think about it as body uploading because, you know, the mind is, is very, like, I don't even know if you could have it completely detached from the body or detached from the environment. Uh, I think the trouble with mind uploading is that you'd have to, you know, a reason why it might come a lot later than we'd like it to is that you need to have sufficient, you know, scanning and, and uh um, like projection capabilities, not just for the mind, but for a whole simulated environment, for a whole simulated body. You know, it goes much farther than just uh, emulating a consciousness because I think, uh, you know, everything's very interconnected. And you know, we heard, um, you know, even quantum phenomena and the brain's microtubules might be part of understanding consciousness. So lots of new research on this is coming out and it might be a lot more uh, complex than we imagine. Um, and another thing, which I, I, I don't think you mentioned this, but this is very interesting, is, is that in uh, 2019, Nature published a paper that demonstrated that scientists were able to map the complete neural networks of nematode worms. Uh, so, you know, they had it all scanned up, uh, but they weren't able to emulate it. And I, and I don't, you know, know everything about this study, uh, but, uh, you know, obviously there might be more just um, beyond uh, the brain. Um, yes, yes, I, I, I agree with you. Um, when I talk about um, mind uploading, uh, I don't mean just like the brain only, because we know that the nervous system is composed of um, the brain and the spinal cord, and it is the spinal cord that helps us, um, and, and the per peripheral nervous system that helps uh, send all of the sensation to our brain so that we can understand and perceive it. Um, and yeah, so basically what I mean is it's not just uploading a brain, it's uploading every like sensory component, uh, which the spinal cord is a part of the central nervous system and a part of the mind too. And also about scanning. Um, when I did the research on scanning, um, it, it was very clear to me that we have to assume that um, mind uploading is possible because we have the ability to scan everything, every molecule to the closest detail, because it's not just the gross structures of the brain that create our mind. It is the synapses or the neurotransmitter, their activities is what give us um, action potential. And uh, eventually I think is um, our thoughts and our emotions. Um, yeah, so so I think um, I, I mentioned in uh, my presentation is that to scan to that level of detail will cost us much more data storage than we have on planet Earth. So Ray Kurzweil says that um, mind up uploading will be widespread and successful. Um, within the 2030s. So that, that is like in the next um, 19 years. Um, and I've argued that we are not going to be ready for it in the next 19 years. It doesn't mean that you, that you couldn't do it, but that no human would want to do it, that the, um, if there is a lot of it in 19 years, then the uh, psychiatry profession 
will benefit very much because those people are, are, are not going to be mentally normal and they're going to be very unhappy and, you know, there'll be lots of problems. Um, if you wait, if you go 10 times longer, like 192 years as opposed to 19 years, then I think maybe all these problems could be worked out and humans could figure out how to be happy in this new state. And it's true, you, you could do space travel, you could do a lot of things much easier as, as an electronic upload than as a biological body. But anyway, that's my argument. Um, and was first expressed in a video that had my seven-year-old granddaughter in it. And you can see what she thought about it too. And um, the reason she was in it is that a lot of famous people do their, their, their most quotable statements, the age of, of uh, 29, you know, and, and uh, she would presumably, if everybody did mind, mind uploading in the 2030s, she would never reach that point. So she, there, there'd no, be no famous quotes from her because, you know, she, she wouldn't need to be speaking English. You could, you know, communicate directly with thoughts, presumably. So she'd skip that whole step of having famous quotations from the age of 29. So anyway, um, yeah, well, in, in the long run, it will be clear that either Kurzweil was right and Kim Solis was wrong or the other way around or somewhere in between, eh? So anyway. All right, well, I, I think that's the time for, for today. Thanks, the two of you very much. Uh, and uh, so next time we'll have three presenters. It looks like we'll never have more than three. And uh, depending on how, how things work out, maybe some occasions when, when they're fewer than three, but so you won't be all like a bunch of people all crammed up together or have to stay much, much longer than you planned for the class period. Um, yeah. Okay, so we will see you on Thursday. And thanks very much for this session today.